I want to introduce uh, Reverend Peter Hall and Pastor Peter Hall and Pastor Carolyn. They're not new to us. We praise God for you. Please come, my brother. Uh, Pastor Peter Hall, who is a trained minister of Assemblies of God in Australia, and then God, in his own way, and his great plan, has brought him to UK. And uh, Pastor P uh, Peter Hall is also a professional accountant, uh, uh, you know, CEO for the Finance, Accounting, and Solutions, blessed with three children. Pastor Carolyn is there. Children's names is James, Jeremy, and Stacy. It's a great privilege, my brother, to be with us. Thank you so much, and I want to give it to you. And thank you for ag agreeing to come and share the word this morning. We welcome you in Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you very much for that warm welcome. Uh, my wife Caroline and I love to, we love to come here. We feel so warmly received. Uh, and we feel a bond of fellowship. Um, and uh, a, a bond of fellowship that is not diminished by time or distance, but it's in Christ, amen? The same Christ in you is the same Christ in me. So even though we might have funny accents and different skin colors, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. That's a supernatural thing, amen? Amen. That could only happen in God. Only God could do that. Thank you. So wonderful worship. I really enjoyed that worship this morning. So let's get stuck into the word, shall we? I wonder if you could put up on the screen the words, the principle of first. The principle of first. Beautiful. See, that looks good. Today I want to talk about the principle of first. And I'm going to talk a bit about tithing and giving. But before I do that, I just want to say that putting God first in our life brings freedom. Brings freedom. Uh, you know, for three years I was a part-time chaplain at a jail in West Lothian. And uh, I remember one particular prisoner said to me, I don't want to be a Christian. And I said, okay. I said, can I ask why don't you want to be a Christian? And he said, because I want to do what I want to do. And I said, I said with respect, sir, that's why you're in prison. Because this is what I said, you can only do what you want to do. But I am free to make a choice to choose love and life. And I thought he was going to hit me. <laughs> but instead he went, oh, I've never seen it like that before. But that's true, isn't it? As believers, we have been set free to choose life, to choose grace, to choose love. Someone who, doesn't, who, who isn't reborn, that we're, someone who hasn't got a reborn spirit they don't have that choice that's why Paul says it is for freedom we are set free and we have this choice to choose life and putting God first in our life brings that freedom putting God first brings that freedom and and doesn't mean that we will not have tribulation but I would rather have tribulation with God than without God. Would you? Because I know that in my tribulation, I have Christ within. I have a supernatural grace within. You know, it's like when the disciples said to Jesus, when are you going to bring in the kingdom? What was Jesus' answer? You will receive power. Jesus, when are you going to change my circumstances? Answer, you will receive power. God doesn't always give the answer we want, but guess what? You will receive power, guaranteed, because we live in his grace, amen? 
be encouraged this morning. Whatever you're going through, you have supernatural grace. You will receive power. You have that supernatural power within. So um, putting Christ first brings that freedom. Um, a couple of biblical phrases I'd like to talk about. The first one is the phrase, first fruits. Has anybody ever read the phrase, first fruits in the Bible? Anybody ever read that when you've read the Bible and it talks about first fruits? Okay, so let's just have a look at this. I wonder if, um, see, when it comes to giving and tithing and putting God first in our life, we need to look at what is God's view and opinion. What does God say? Okay, and this is, the, this is how we find out. So let's go to Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13. And this is virtually the birth of a nation. The children of Israel, uh, or Israel, or the Hebrews, or whatever you'd like to call it, are about to cross the Red Sea and come into the promises that God gave their forefathers, Abraham. And look at this, what, what God says. If we look at Exodus 13, could we get that on the screen, Exodus 13, verse 1? Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. See that phrase, first? Consecrate to me all the firstborn, Whoever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both man of man and beast, it is mine. So right from the start, we have God's mind. That that which is, if we could just go back, just go back. We have God's mind that that which is given to God first is consecrated. And all that means is it is separate. Okay, so God is saying to them right from the start, your firstborn, separate it, it is mine. Okay, the, God is starting to show his people, put me first. Put me first. Okay, and we see this further down in verse 11. Let's read verse 11 to 14. It's a wonderful revelation here. It shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites. That's what God promised Abraham in Genesis 15. So God is starting to fulfill that promise. As he swore to you, oh there it is there. As he swore to you, uh, uh, to you and your fathers, that's Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and gives it to you, that you shall set apart to the Lord... All that open the womb, that is every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have. The males shall be the Lord's. Next verse. And every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem. Interesting word. You shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. For all the firstborn of men among your sons, you shall redeem. We'll just hold that there. Do you know in that verse, we've actually got the gospel? You see, it says the first of a donkey. What is a donkey? What is a donkey known for? Stubbornness. And do you know, before we came to Christ, we were donkeys. Stubborn, stiff-necked, rebellious. But we were redeemed by a lamb. The gospel there. Do you, do you remember part, what we call, or what people call Palm Sunday? What happened? Jesus rode, Jesus the Lamb of God, rode on the back of a donkey. Remember that? So you've got the gospel there. That us donkeys were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. 
Isn't that wonderful? So we've got this sense of the donkey was unclean, but the lamb was clean because it was inspected and spotless. Do you remember Pilate said to Jesus, I find no fault in him. He was perfect. And we've been redeemed. Us donkeys have been redeemed by a perfect lamb. Don't you love him this morning? I love the word of God. The unclean was redeemed by the clean. And the point I want to make to you is this something that you may not have thought of. That Now try and get this. Jesus was God's tithe to you. Because Jesus is the firstborn. Now I want to show you. Is that scriptural? Let's have a look. Could you get Romans 8 verse 29? And this is New Covenant scripture. Look at this. For whom he foreknew, that's God, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Now look, that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. So Jesus is the firstborn among us, the church. You see, God believes in the principle of first. And Jesus, if you like, was God's tithe. God gave us his best, Jesus. Wow. You see, the firstborn is consecrated and holy and separate to him. And we get Jesus. Do you love him this morning? Isn't he wonderful? And just go to the next verse. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Exodus 13, 14. Back to our original scripture. So it shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what is this that you shall say to him? What is this that means? Why are you, why are you sacrificing a lamb for a donkey? Why are you doing that, Dad? You shall say to him, by the strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Friends, can I say this to you? Tell your children about how God changed your life. Tell them how you were a donkey redeemed by a lamb. Tell them that you give a tithe, the tenth part of your money to the church because it's holy and separate. And I was, say, I was, once I was a donkey. I was in sin. I was rebellious, stubborn, stiff-necked. But I've been redeemed by a lamb. Tell them. Tell your children. Train them. You know, we have the three children. We used to, I used to try and, around the dinner table, at least three times a week, I tried to get home early enough because I was a corporate manager, finance manager, and about three, sometimes four times a week, around the dinner table, I would read the scriptures to my children. And Carol would be there, and I would tell my kids about Jesus. And I would tell them about giving and so on. You see, that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to train the next generation. Because I'm getting old. <laughs> I'm gone soon. <laughs> We need the next generation to know that they're just donkeys, but they've been redeemed by a lamb. Amen? Now, there's another beautiful picture of this that I love. Leviticus 23, verses 9 to 12. This is, I love this. Leviticus 23, 9 to 12. We get another beautiful picture of Jesus here being the first if you like, being God's tithe. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When you come into the land which I give to you, and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits. Right. Did you see that? The first fruits. So all that means is, 
Don't get caught up in the language. It simply means the first part of your fruit, the first part of your harvest. That, that's what first fruits means. That's all it is. It's not a mystical word. Just the first part, the best part, the preeminent part. Okay? When you come to the land and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of first fruits. Okay, if you could get the next, read the next verse. Thanks, brother. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer on that day, when you wave the sheaf, a male lamb of the first year, without blemish, as a burnt offering to the Lord. Okay, so this is the picture. This is the picture. They would get their harvest of their wheat and they'd bundle it. That's a sheaf, is a bundle. They'd get the bundle. Now watch what I'm about to do, because this is what the Lord commanded them to do. Watch this. See if you can pick something. What shape's that? It's a cross. See that? The sheaf of first fruits is Christ. Christ was waved before God when he ascended to heaven and he gave his blood for us. Do you remember when, when he was resurrected, Jesus said, don't touch me. I haven't yet ascended to my father a week later he just says to thomas touch me look what happened in seven days he ascended to the father and the blood of the cross was given to father and he was waved now why is that important because he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. Friends, Israel was only accepted in the sheaf. The, the King James Version says, to be accepted for you. Friends, you are accepted only in the sheaf, in Christ. Could we get Ephesians 1.6? And we see this in the New Testament. I think Paul knew this about the Feast of first fruits. Look at this. To the praise and glory of his grace, by which God, he, has made us accepted in the beloved. Beloved's capital B, that's Jesus. So if we are acceptable to the Father in Christ. Wow, isn't that great? And, that's, and, and it's interesting uh, that in this we have, can we go back to Leviticus 23? I just want to show you something. Back to Leviticus 23. Do you love the word of God? Isn't it life-changing and powerful? Wow. Don't take your identity messages from the world, friends. Get it from the word. You are not rejected. You are acceptable to God in the sheaf. Amen. Okay. I go to the next verse. Look what was offered with this. Look what was offered with it. You shall offer on that day when you wave the sheaf a male lamb. So not only was this A male lamb, a firstborn, a firstborn lamb, spotless, was offered. You see, the reason we are acceptable to God is because of the blood of the lamb, okay, the death of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus. That's the sheaf. You see? And that's why I love this verse. If you could go to Romans chapter 5, verse 10. Romans chapter 5, verse 10. For if when we were enemies, 
we were reconciled. He's the blood of the Lamb. We were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Much more having been reconciled, that's the Lamb, now we shall be saved, resurrected by His life. See, Jesus just didn't die. He resurrected too. See, and in this picture we have Jesus is the first. The God's best. God's best was given to us. And just on that, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23. Just so you know, I'm not making this up. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits. There you go. Christ afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. That's us. See, he's the firstborn amongst many brethren. Amen? So have I convinced you that God gave Jesus first? Have I convinced you that God has given us his best? The principle of first is very powerful, friends. We are here today because of the principle of first fruits. The reason we are here today is because Jesus, the firstborn, the first fruits, God's tithe, was given to the house of God, to the kingdom. And we are those afterward. We are the many brethren. Amen? So, Leviticus chapter 27.30. Hope you don't mind me going through scripture today. Who's learning something? You're learning something? Amen. That's excellent. Well, that's the Holy Spirit revealing that. I can just talk, but the Holy Spirit has to open our eyes to that. Okay. Here is the first mention of the word tithe, which simply means the first part or the first tenth part. All the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy. So that is the first mention of the word tithe in Scripture. And as far as God's concerned, it is holy. It is precious. Jesus was precious, amen? Not, take, not to be taken lightly. Jesus was separate, holy. And our tithe, the first fruits that we bring, whatever we bring to God, when God is first in our life, it is separate and it is holy it is consecrated so practically speaking then if i can just say this just a few practical things that um actually let's go to i'll just jump around a bit uh go to exodus 23 verse 19 exodus 23 19 Brother Binley, you'd like to read that. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Okay, we'll ignore the goat for the moment. <laughs> the first of the first fruits of your land bring to the house of God. Okay, and in a moment we're going to see if that's new covenant as well. We're reading old covenant. We'll do that in a minute. But right now the principle is God would like us to bring the first part to the house. To the house. Friends, if... How... Can you imagine if the previous generation never gave to their church? Would we be here today? Do you know why you are saved? Because other people knew the principle of first. They gave of their first income to the church. And because of that, you heard the gospel. Amen? If you went to Sunday school as a child, the only reason that Sunday school existed is because the adults in that time knew the principle of first and gave a tenth part of their income to that church so you could grow up in Sunday school. 
See how powerful the principle of first is? Very powerful. Would you agree? Amen. Very powerful. So, practically speaking, uh, a, a tithe is the first tenth of your wage. So before tax, before NICs, before payments to British Gas, Sky, okay, the principle of first is that we honour God because he has blessed us. And we bring the first fruits of our harvest, our pay packet, to him. That's, now, if, if you are a business person, it's a tenth part of your increase. So after all your expenses, uh, after all, all your expenses, the increase is what you tithe on. Uh, if you have a rental property, it's a tenth after all your mortgage payments, your real estate agent's fees, all that. It's the increase. Okay, that, that is a tenth. Okay, and the Lord says, bring it into the house of the Lord. Friends, how will Glasgow know about the power of the gospel that we experience if there's no churches? If there's no churches, Glasgow dies. Is that right? The only reason that the gospel can be preached amongst your family, amongst your, your group of friends, amongst your town, is because people tithe. They're giving that first part, that first, that they know the principle of first. What would it be like if none of us paid taxes? No rail, no roads, no, no in, nothing. Is that right? Okay, so, so if the world has a principle, but they want more than a tenth. They want sometimes 50%. But God just says, bring it. If everybody tithes, oh, sorry, if everybody tithes, did you hear what I just said earlier? Sorry. If everybody tithes and understands the principle of first, church thrives and our children, our loved ones, our community gets to hear the gospel. Amen? It's, it, that's just logic, isn't it? Amen? And I know that your pastor, uh, your pastors and leaders, they work for themselves. They, they pay their own bills. Wouldn't it be good if one day this church could support Pastor Praveen part-time, full-time? Can you imagine how powerful you would be? Wow. That will only happen when we understand the principle of first. Amen? So, is tithing in the New Testament? Now, the reason I want to just quickly talk about this there is a thinking in the body of Christ that says tithing is old covenant. It's not in the new covenant. Friends, that is not scriptural. Okay, I'm going to show you why. Okay, so we know that first fruits, do you, do you remember Cain and Abel? God did not regard Cain's offering, but he regarded Abel's offering. Because Abel came with his heart. He came out of the principle of first. Okay, in Genesis 14, now this is before the law. Abel's before the law, Genesis 14. Melchizedek, who by the way, was Jesus Christ. We won't get into that now. Melchizedek was Jesus Christ. Read it in Hebrews. It was a pre-cross manifestation of Christ. Melchizedek blesses Abraham, and can I quote the scripture? Abraham gave a tithe of all. So Melchizedek blesses Abraham, Abraham tithes back. Okay? Um, in Genesis 28, uh, 22, Jacob gave a tenth. And then we talked about the first fruits and so on. Now let's go to the New Covenant, the New Testament. Here's some quick points. Is tithing, giving, 
new covenant. Okay, the early church were very old covenant trained and they understood how important tithing was. And they didn't have to teach it much because they already knew it. In Matthew 23, 23, Jesus mentions tithing. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You pay tithe. Actually, can we go to, can we go to um, Matthew 23, 23? Yeah. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. You pay tithe on mint and anise and cumin. That's spices. But you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, faith. These you ought to have done. Now, Jesus is playing on words here because mint, ever seen a mint leaf? It's very light. And you know what they used to do? They used to literally count the mint leaves to tithe. They'd count them. And Jesus is saying, you've missed it. It's not about the number. You've missed it. It's of the heart. And, and the weightier matters, which is weightier than mint and spice, is justice, mercy, and faith. So Jesus says in the New Testament that we should tithe. Um, in Luke chapter 21, we won't look it up, Luke chapter 21, 1 to 4, is the lady who gave the two mites. And Jesus said she gave more than all the rich people. Why? Gave it of the heart. What do I mean by of the heart? A response to the life she got from God. She, had, she must have had a revelation of God. Hebrews talks about Aaron giving tithes. And he's the one I just want to, the main one I want to talk about. Could we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 14? 1 Corinthians 9, 14. The, this is Paul speaking to the Corinthians. So the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. The King James Version, are you able to quickly jump over to the King James? Because there's a word here I want to look at. Uh, verse 14, was it? Sorry. 14. Previous verse. Even so has the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live off the gospel. Friends, if the Lord has ordained that those who minister the kingdom to us can live off the preaching of the word, if it's ordained, listen to this, there's a blessing in it. It means it's anointed. So our tithe, when we, set, when we give out of the principle of first, out of a response to God giving to us, and we give out of a heart of thanksgiving, God ordains a blessing in the house. Your pastor gets blessed, your pastor's family gets blessed, the church gets blessed, Glasgow gets blessed, you get blessed. Amen? There's blessing in tithing. Anointing flows. Ministry flourishes. The local church stays healthy and grows. You know, friends, this is only me, but I believe one of the biggest problems of preaching the good news of the gospel in the world today is not lack of anointing. It's lack of finance. I believe that is the biggest problem, uh, well, certainly one of the biggest problems. There's other problems as well. I shouldn't say the biggest. That's hyperbole. That's, that's a big word. But one of the biggest problems is not lack of anointing. Today in the house, we sense God's presence, amen? He burns in our hearts. Even as I preach the word, I can tell. There's light globes going above the head. The Holy Spirit's opening eyes to his grace and his goodness. Okay? That's, that's not a problem. The problem is the lack of finance. Okay? So your tithes pay the bills 
And I would love to see one day that your pastor can be, could, could be at least part-time, but certainly full-time. This church would certainly uh, experience increase. Amen? Because where God ordains something, there's an anointing, there's a flow, there's an expression of God's heart and spirit. So, just like Abraham before the law, we pass it through the cross into the new covenant. We share communion. Melchizedek blesses us. That's Jesus. And we give out of the principle of first because God gave to us out of the principle of first. So, is tithing in the new covenant? Yes? Is tithing in the New Testament? Did God tithe to us? Amen. Amen. The principle of first. Okay. Could we go to Galatians chapter 6? I'm aware that we'll come around the communion shortly. Galatians chapter 6. As I was preparing for this, I just saw something fresh. In Galatians 6, how are we going? We're okay? Amen. Brethren, if a man be overtaken oh, in a fault. Sorry, sorry. Verse, verse, verse. Verse 6 to 10. Verse 6 to 10. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Okay. Now, it says there in verse 6, let him who is taught the word share... Just go back to verse 6. Let him who is taught the word communicate to him... Actually, can we go back to New King James? Back to the modern, modern English. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches... Okay, so what it's saying there, that if you are taught the word, share what you have with the one who is giving you that word. Okay, because I know myself, I've got to live. That's why I've got an accounting business on the side, so I can eat. <laughs> Amen? So, um, uh, what it's saying there, let him who is taught the word share. So let's, let's localize this. Let brother Praveen... Share in what God has given you. Then it goes, then it says something strange. Look at the next verse. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, whatever a man sows, that will he reap. What's that got to do with money? What a funny thing to skip from verse 6 to verse 7. And then I realized what he's talking about. You see, the context of this, these verses is that the Judaizers went to the Galatians and said, you're not just saved by grace, you need law mixed in with it. You need law mixed in with it. And Paul has just been spending these chapters, verse, you know, chapter 3, 4 and 5, saying, no, 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 it's not Jesus on one hand and Moses on the other. It's purely the grace of God you're saved. It's not the law. It's not going back to the old things. You're only saved by, the, by faith in the grace of God. And so what he's saying here, you can't outsmart God. You can't go back to Moses and think you're going to be blessed in a new covenant way. You're not going to experience the grace of God trying to live by the law. That's what he's saying there. For if you sow to the law, you will reap the law. That's what he's saying. So therefore, what Paul is saying 
is let him who is taught the word share in the word. So if you are being taught the grace of God, if you are being taught kingdom living, if you are being taught how to live in the power of God, if you are being taught new covenant, then sow into that house. Sow into that ministry. You can't outwit God. It doesn't come by law. It comes by sowing into a house that will give you grace. You know, Galatians 3, foolish Galatians. You started in the spirit. Now you think you're going to perfect in the, in the flesh? That's the context. Okay, we can't outwit God. It's not formula. But we come with our tithes and our offerings. We sow to the house. And as we sow in a spiritual house, we reap a spiritual harvest. The gospel is preached. You are taught how to live in the new covenant. You are taught kingdom living. Your children are brought up in the power of the gospel, in the presence of God. They're taught how to worship. They're taught how to hold a microphone and, and give a testimony. They're taught how to play an instrument. All these things come as you sow into something spiritual. Amen? And that's why it jumps from that funny verse six to, from verse 6 to this funny verse 7. It is linked. I encourage you, read Galatians 3, 4, 5, 6 again. And read it from the point of view of what Paul is trying to do. Get people out of flesh, get people out of law, get people out of formula, and bring them into being led by the Spirit. Amen? Okay, I need to wrap this up. Uh, just very quickly, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7. I'll hand it over very shortly to Brother Praveen for the communion. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. So I just want to close with a few thoughts. Let's not just think, I've got to give a tithe. You don't have to give anything. But God gave his best for us because he wanted to. He didn't have to. He did it because he loves you. And out of that heart of cheerfulness and generosity, we can give back a tithe. God's ordained it, that there's an anointing and a blessing that comes with it. Let's, let's not be small-hearted. Let's be big-hearted people. Amen. Of all the people on the earth, us Christians, we should be the biggest-hearted people on the earth. Amen. Let's be generous with our time, with our love, you know, when I came in the door, Deborah gave me the biggest hug and it was like I'd never left. I gave my wife a big hug. Welcome back. You see, we should be generous. Amen. Because you know what? I took that as God giving me a hug because it's the Christ in Deborah that gave me the hug. Amen. When you cross the floor and give someone a cup of tea in the Lord's name, that's like the Lord giving them a cup of tea and blessing them. See, we're in a different kingdom, friends. We've got to think different. We're of the Spirit. We're in a kingdom that is spiritual. Tithing is spiritual. It brings a spiritual harvest. Amen? It's powerful. See the principle of first? And that's why we can be big-hearted people. Big-hearted people. With a generous spirit. Boy, I've got so much more I could bring you, but I think I would be diminishing what I've already said if I bought that. So, can I just maybe pray before I hand it over for communion? Is that okay? i just like to pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, on behalf of every person here this morning, we thank you for your generosity. We thank you for your big heart towards us. We thank you. We worship you. Lord, as we sang today, I will follow. 
Lord, we, we thank you for your big heartedness that you gave the firstborn of many brethren to us, Jesus. And Lord, in response, teach us by your Holy Spirit, teach us to be big hearted, teach us to be generous people, teach us to be the most generous people on earth. And Lord, as, as these precious people, Lord, who are accepted in the sheaf, accepted in the beloved, as they sow generously into this house, may it reap a generous spiritual harvest, Lord, of souls. Lord, that our children would grow up in the kingdom, having firm foundations in a revelation of Jesus Christ, knowing how to understand the Word, to be led by the Spirit, we pray for them. Lord, for the leaders of this house, I pray for them that they would be equipped for every good work. Oh God, as this precious church understands the principle of first, first and sows spiritually with their finances and of their time and efforts and love, Lord, I pray that it would reap an abundant harvest. Oh, Lord, we pray for Glasgow. Bring souls into the kingdom. Oh, God. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, take the word today. And I pray that your spirit would bring revelation that only you can give. Brings life. Thank you, Lord. Bless your Father.